the nasty little truth about a pardon or being forgiven is that it can be revoked. Yes, God could change his mind about it. Are you pardoned or are you justified? Is there a difference? Oh, yeah. There is a big difference. And that's the goal of me, Martin Zender, here in Studio One from Fort Lauderdale. It's my goal to give you the difference between forgiveness, which sounds great. To be forgiven from your sins, doesn't that sound like just the best? It's not the best. It's second best. It's not bad, but there's something better that is given to members of the body of Christ, and it's justification. Yesterday, we were talking about difference number 11. And that was uh, new, uh, born again versus new creation. I'm going through 31 differences between these two Gospels, the Gospel of the Grace of God and the Gospel, gospel of the Kingdom. The gospel of the Kingdom is a 1,000-year time period promised to Israel by God where they will rule the earth. It's literal. It's going to happen. The capital of it will be in Jerusalem. It's for Israelites. Non-Israelites can get in it if they're proselytes of Israel. That is, if they kowtow, if they, if they bow down to the favored nation there's baptism involved there's still ceremony involved there's still fleshly advantage involved and this is actually going to happen but we in the meantime we are called into the body of christ which is a an organization an organism given to the apostle paul who wrote 13 letters these are our marching orders all scripture is for us Ladies and gentlemen, but all scripture is not written to us. The gospel of the circumcision, difference number 12. Peter's gospel, the Israelites are pardoned of guilt. They're pardoned of what? Say it again. What, what are they pardoned of? Guilt. They're guilty. They're pardoned of guilt. Another way to say that is they're forgiven. Luke 11, 4. And I quote, and pardon us for our sins, for we ourselves also are pardoning everyone who is owing us. And mayest thou not bring us into trial, but rescue us from the wicked one. All right, that's a literal quote of the uh, world-famous Lord's Prayer. Um, it's actually not the Lord's Prayer, it's the disciples' prayer. The Lord gave it to his disciples to pray. Uh, the verse I just read to you is com commonly translated this way. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, a important point about forgiveness you need to know, <clears throat> excuse me, is that forgiveness assumes guilt. If forgiveness could talk, this is what it would say. You did wrong, but I will pretend that you didn't. There's a penalty for your crime, but I will overlook it for now and let you off the hook. This is the most critical thing you need to remember here is forgiveness assumes guilt. You're guilty of a crime, but we're going to overlook the penalty. The English elements of the Greek word for forgive, ephemi, for instance, is the Greek word, ephemi, A-P-H-E-M-I. A is the negative, and phemi means to let. It's the from let. In other words, it's to let from something, to let somebody off the hook, basically to let you off of the penalty of whatever crime you committed. And a crime is, is part of it. You, there, a crime, forgiveness requires a crime, requires guilt. As wonderful as forgiveness and pardon are, the nasty little truth about forgiveness and pardon is that a pardon can be revoked. A pardon is dependent upon keeping it up, upon pardoning other people, upon requesting it constantly. We see this in Matthew 18, verses 23 through 25, the parable of the 10,000 talent debtor. Do you remember this one? The master remitted his slave's gigantic debt. The guy begged him, please, oh master, I owe you so much money, but I can't pay it. And he worshiped him and begged him and the guy let him off. But the pardon was recalled when that slave, you remember this, refused to extend the same forgiveness to his servant. So the permanence of a pardon depends on the conduct of the one receiving it. This is where Christianity loves conduct. 
they love to keep their conduct up. They love they love to have to keep it up. They like the idea of pardon. They like the excitement of this can be revoked. Ooh, that's exciting. That means that I can distinguish myself from other people. My pardon is still in play. Your pardon was revoked. Why? Because you weren't a good person. You didn't forgive somebody else. You didn't pray to the Lord the right way. All this distinguishes, um, and this is this is allowed for in the kingdom evangel. It distinguishes individual merit because the gospel of the kingdom is a mixture of law and grace, and individual merit is part of it. And this is shown in this parable. That guy didn't show the merit, and so his pardon was revoked. Human conduct However, from my experience, comes and goes. Therefore, so does pardon. Yeah, a pardon, a pardon can be withdrawn. So the Jews and Christians who want to be Jews constantly have to be on guard for their salvation and for God to show favor to them. Does that sound like fun? I mean, even if it's not, it's not fun, but if this was required of us, then we have to deal with it. We have to do it. But what if it's not required of us in the body of Christ? What if this is another difference between the body of Christ and Israel? In the gospel of the uncircumcision, on the other hand, Paul's gospel, we are not even guilty. Huh? <laughs> Sounds radical, doesn't it? Another word for not being guilty is justified. The root word in the word justified is just. And Christians talk about justification. They have no idea what it is. They think they're justified and pardoned at the same time. They, again, they just, like I said yesterday, they just take these terms and throw them around interchangeably to suit their need. If they want to sound all gracey and all apostle paul -y, then they'll tell you well, you're justified. And then in the next breath, they'll say, you have to forgive your brother or else God won't forgive you. The two things are mutually exclusive because pardon assumes guilt. Justification denies guilt. The root word of justification is just. And a synonym for just is right. No court in the land, let's use Richard Nixon as, as an example. No court in the land would have found him not guilty of wrongdoing. So he was guilty of wrongdoing. And Richard Nixon, as you remember, was pardoned, not justified. He was a pardon, again, says, you did wrong, but we're going to overlook the penalty. Gerald Ford, who became president after that, forgave or pardoned Richard Nixon. So I want you to realize how radical it is to be justified. It means to be right, to be pronounced not guilty. And how can a person who's not guilty be forgiven? It's impossible. It's impossible for a person who's not guilty to be forgiven. It's like, you're not guilty of, of, of this crime. You're completely innocent of this crime. You didn't do it, right? In fact, you acted rightly. Therefore, we're going to overlook the penalty. What? Yeah, you didn't do anything wrong, so tell you what we're going to do. You're completely innocent, so tell you what we're going to do. We're going to overlook the penalty. What penalty? I'm innocent. I'm not guilty. You see, forgiveness and justification, they are, can't be commingled in any way. They don't play nice together. They don't sit at the same table. They're as opposite as can be. No one overlooks the penalty of a justified person because a justified person was never subject to a penalty in the first place. So, again, this justification has been degraded by the religious world to a little understood theological term. That's all it is to them. But really, it's no more complicated than, I like to break down these words and look at how we apply them, like right margin justification. When you write something in your word processing program and you write margin justify, it means that you bring all your text and align it to a standard. The standard, is the, in this case, is the right margin. All right, very well then. Now you understand justification. That's it. See, I take these complex, what appear to be complex theological terms, and make them simple. You bring something in alignment to a standard. God does this with us. His standard is Christ, and he aligns us with Christ, and he looks at us that way. 
And does he do this based on our behavior? Quick answer is no. We are justified gratuitously in his grace through the deliverance which is in Christ Jesus. I didn't make that up. That's Romans 3, 24. If he based justification on our behavior, we can never be justified. Why? Because Paul says in Romans 3, there's no one just, no, not one. According to Paul, we are reckoned, we are reckoning a human to be justified by faith. You just believe this thing. It operates on your behalf now, but it's impractical to you unless you you believe it. You believing it doesn't make it real. You believing it brings you into a realization that it's true. According to Paul, then, we are reckoning a human to be justified by faith apart from works of law. Romans 3, 28. So, stop begging God. This is the bottom line for you. Stop begging God for forgiveness every day. What are you trying to do? You're insulting him. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. He's tired of hearing it. If you were an Israelite, God could tolerate it. But you're not an Israelite. He's revealed to you the depths of the cross. He's revealed to you the new creation. He's revealed to you the awful sufferings of Christ and how they have made you right with him. Christ suffered so that you could be aligned to the perfect standard of Christ. So when you roll on the floor, all crying all the time that you can never please God, you spend your day begging him to forgive you. Please forgive me. Please be nice to me. He's up there rolling his eyes like, what are you doing? Haven't you read what I, I've said lately on the topic of sin? So your groveling actually insults what God accomplished through his son on the horrible cross. The cross was horrible for a reason. The reason is your sin and your guilt. But it's not a problem anymore because of the cross. Whether we live in this reality, this is a reality, what I'm telling you. Whether we live in it or not, God has justified us. He's already done it. So you can either live in the reality and realize that God does see you even now through the person and the work of Christ, or you can roll on the floor, spend your days consumed with yourself, really. I think that religious self-consumption is the ugliest kind, and you can unnecessarily cry and beg God to do something about your flesh. Please, do something about my flesh, forgive me. You're begging him to do something that he already did 2,000 years ago. You're a new creation in Christ. Folks, wake up and smell the justification.